This shipping container, sitting in one of the driest places on Earth, is doing something that should be impossible. It's pulling water out of the air, not humidity from the ocean, not moisture from clouds, just the desert air around it. Air so dry it cracks your lips in minutes. And it's producing a thousand liters of drinking water per day, enough for 200 people, in a place where annual rainfall is 50 millimeters. That's less than Phoenix, Arizona, less than Las Vegas. This is real. It's happening right now and it could change everything we know about water scarcity. Now, before you think cool tech but doesn't affect me, let me stop you right there. If you live in California, Texas, Arizona, Spain, India, Australia, or basically anywhere that gets hot summers, this affects you. Climate change is making droughts longer and more severe. Traditional water sources, rivers, aquifers, even rain are becoming unreliable. So here's the question that keeps water engineers awake at night. What if we've been looking in the wrong place for water this whole time? Welcome back to Grand Structures. Today, we're investigating atmospheric water generation, the technology that could make water scarcity optional. We'll explore the science, the economics, the brutal limitations, and the question everyone's asking. Can you really farm water from the sky in a desert? Let's find out. Here's something that will blow your mind. The atmosphere contains 13,000 cubic kilometers of water right now. That's 13 trillion tons. It's constantly evaporating from oceans, lakes, even your breath, and it's everywhere. To put that in perspective, that's more water than all the rivers on Earth combined. It's just invisible, suspended as vapor molecules between the nitrogen and oxygen you're breathing right now. You already know how to capture atmospheric water. You've seen it thousands of times. Take a cold glass of water outside on a humid day. Water droplets form on the outside. That's condensation. The glass cooled the air around it below its dew point the temperature where air can't hold water vapor anymore, and it becomes liquid. This is the fundamental physics behind atmospheric water generators, AWGs for short. Cool air below its dew point, collect the condensation, filter it, mineralize it, and drink it. Simple, right? Wrong, because here's the brutal reality. AWG works beautifully in hot, humid climates. Miami, Singapore, Bangkok. In these places, air at 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and 80% humidity contains 24 grams of water per kilogram of air. You can practically drink the air. But in the Negev Desert, same temperature, 30 degrees Celsius, but humidity drops to 20% during summer days. Now that same kilogram of air contains only 5 grams of water. That's 80% less moisture. And worse, the dew point is now 3 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. You have to cool that air by 27 degrees just to start condensing water. In Miami, an AWG might use 0.3 kilowatt hours to produce one liter of water. Efficient, economical. But in the desert, under the same tech, six kilowatt hours per liter. That's 20 times more energy. At 15 cents per kilowatt hour, you're paying almost a dollar just for the electricity to make one liter of water. This is why most experts said atmospheric water generation in deserts was a pipe dream too expensive, too energy intensive, thermodynamically insane. But Israel looked at those experts and said, hold my hummus, we're doing it anyway. First, let's talk about Watergen. Founded in 2009, they're the company that made AWG mainstream. Their machines are deployed in 80 plus countries and their approach is elegant, advanced cooling condensation. Here's how it works. Air gets sucked in and passes through a patented heat exchange system they call Genius. Instead of using a traditional air conditioning compressor, which wastes tons of energy cooling air you don't need, Watergen's system uses a sophisticated heat exchanger that only cools the air to extract maximum moisture while recycling as much thermal energy as possible. The result? 
they've gotten their energy consumption down to 250 watt hours per liter, about 0.25 kilowatt hours per liter. That's a 75% improvement over traditional AWG systems. Their large scale units can produce 6,000 liters per day. Their medium unit, the Gen M, produces 1,000 liters. Even their home unit, the Jenny, makes 27 liters daily. But here's where Watergen's marketing team doesn't want me to show you this graph. This is real-world performance data. At 80% humidity, their systems perform at rated capacity, producing that 1,000 liters per day. Beautiful. But watch what happens as humidity drops. That Gen M rated for 1,000 liters, in summer desert conditions, it might produce 100 liters. Still useful, still impressive, but not the miracle the brochure promised. And the energy cost per liter skyrockets. Which brings us to H2OLL, a Technion University spin-off that said, we're not going to fight the desert's low humidity, we're going to use it. H2OLL uses a completely different approach called cyclic absorption, and it's brilliant. Instead of cooling air, they use a liquid desiccant, essentially a super-concentrated salt solution that's 10 times saltier than seawater. Step 1. Absorption. Air enters the system and passes through the liquid desiccant. Salt naturally attracts water molecules, even at low humidity. The desiccant absorbs moisture from the air, becoming more diluted with water. Step 2. Desorption. The water-rich desiccant is pumped into a chamber with controlled vacuum. Lower pressure means lower boiling point. The water evaporates out of the desiccant as pure water vapor, leaving the salt behind. Step 3. Condensation. The vapor is condensed back into liquid water. Because you're only cooling the 2% of air that's actually water vapor, not the entire air mass, energy consumption drops by 65% compared to traditional AWG. Step 4. Regeneration. The desiccant is instantly regenerated and cycles back to step 1. Continuous operation, no downtime. Here's the kicker. While Watergen's output drops 80 to 90% in low humidity, H2OLL's system can operate with just 5 grams of water per kilogram of air, half the minimum that traditional AWG needs. In September 2024, they launched their first full-scale unit in the Negev, and it's producing rated capacity in the desert in summer. Their pilot unit produces 1,000 liters per day, they're planning to scale up to 10,000 liters per day units powered entirely by solar panels. If, and this is a big if, they can hit their cost targets, they're talking about water at 3 to 5 cents per liter in the desert. That's competitive with trucking water in. Okay, let's talk money, because fancy tack means nothing if the economics don't work. Here's the full cost breakdown for producing water via AWG in Israel's Negev. Capital costs, H2OLL 1,000 liter per day unit. Equipment, around $100,000 to $150,000, estimated. Solar panels, 3 to 5 kilowatts, $9,000 to $15,000. Installation, $5,000 to $10,000. Total initial investment, around $120,000 to $180,000. Operating costs, annual, energy, if grid powered, $3,500 to $7,000. Maintenance and filters, $2,000 to $3,000. Desiccant replacement, $500 to $1,000. Total operating costs, around $6,000 to $11,000 per year. Water production, 1,000 liters per day times 365 days is around 365,000 liters per year. Cost per liter, 0.03 to 0.05 USD. 3 to 5 cents per liter. Now let's compare that to alternatives in remote Negev locations. Trucking water, 50 cents to $2 per liter, depending on distance. Bottled water, 30 cents to $1 per liter. Desalination, if coast, 0.001 to 0 0.002 dollars per liter, but requires $500 million plant and pipelines. AWG, H2OLL, 3 cents to 5 cents per liter. So AWG isn't competitive with large-scale desalination. It never will be. But for remote, off-grid locations where trucking water costs 50 cents to $2 per liter, 
AWG becomes economically viable. The math works. This is the part most people miss. AWG isn't meant to replace national water grids. It's not competing with desalination plants. It's solving a different problem, last mile water delivery to places no one else can reach economically. The actual use cases, remote Bedouin villages in the Negev, no water infrastructure, military bases in arid regions, US, Israel, UAE militaries are major buyers. Disaster relief, hurricanes, earthquakes and floods destroy water systems. Construction sites in deserts, temporary, high water costs. Off-grid eco-lodges and resorts, sustainability plus necessity. Refugee camps in arid regions, 3.5 billion people lack clean water one month a year. WaterGen supplied emergency water during the 2020 Beirut explosion. They've deployed units in African villages with no wells. H2OLL is targeting schools in the Negev with no municipal water connection. This isn't about replacing Los Angeles' water supply. It's about reaching the 2 billion people traditional infrastructure can't. Let's be brutally honest about AWG's limitations. First, it doesn't work everywhere. Even H2OLL's advanced system needs at least 20% relative humidity to function economically. In the true hyper-arid deserts, the Sahara interior, Death Valley, the Atacama Desert, annual average humidity drops below 15%. AWG becomes prohibitively expensive. Second, energy. Even H2OLL's efficient system uses 0.35 to 0.5 kilowatt hours per liter in desert conditions. For 1,000 liters per day, that's 350 to 500 kilowatt hours daily. You need 3 to 5 kilowatts of continuous power. Solar panels help, but you still need batteries for nighttime operation. That adds $10,000 to $20,000 to costs. Third, scale limitations. Israel's national water consumption is 2.2 billion cubic meters per year. That's 6 million cubic meters per day. To produce that with AWG, you'd need 6,000 of H2OLL's 1,000 liter units. Cost? Over $700 million in equipment alone. Desalination? Cheaper, more reliable, more scalable. AWG is not a replacement for desalination or water infrastructure. It's a supplementary, decentralized solution for niche applications. But here's where it gets interesting. Climate change is making humidity patterns more unpredictable. Some deserts are getting slightly more humid due to shifting weather patterns. The Negev has seen average humidity rise 2 to 3 percent over 30 years. Not much, but enough to improve AWG efficiency by 15 to 20 percent. Models predict that by 2050, some arid regions, particularly coastal deserts, could see humidity increases that make AWG significantly more viable. Meanwhile, traditional water sources like rivers and aquifers are drying up faster than expected. So the question isn't, will AWG replace traditional water sources? It's, as traditional sources fail, will AWG become one of several essential backup systems? The atmospheric water generator market was worth $2.8 billion in 2024 and is projected to hit $6.1 billion by 2034. That's 8% annual growth. And it's not just Israel. The entire world is racing to crack this code. Major players. WaterGen Israel. 6,000 liters per day units deployed in 80 plus countries. H2OLL Israel. 1,000 liters desiccant systems targeting 10,000 liters per day. Ecolo Blue USA. Home and commercial units largest market share. Skywater, USA, military-grade systems. Genek, Spain, high-efficiency units for Europe. Watermaker, India, partnered with Israel for the Indian market. The U.S. military is heavily investing in AWG. A 2024 Air Force Institute of Technology study analyzed AWG for Indo-Pacific operations. Their conclusion? 
In humid tropical bases like the Philippines, AWG can reliably produce water at 50 to 70 percent of rated capacity. In desert bases, below 10 percent. But for agile combat employment, small dispersed forces, even 10 percent output beats trucking water 500 miles through contested territory. The Israel Defense Forces are testing H2O LIL units for remote outposts. The UAE is deploying water gin units in desert military bases. When war makes water logistics a liability, AWG becomes a strategic asset. So here's my honest take. Atmospheric water generation in the desert works. It's real technology producing real water in some of the harshest conditions on Earth but it's not a miracle cure for water scarcity. What AWG is good for? Remote, off-grid communities, 50 to 500 people, emergency disaster relief, military forward operating bases, high-value, low-volume applications, schools, medical clinics, regions where trucking water costs 50 cents per liter plus. What AWG is not? Replacement for large-scale desalination. Economically viable in hyper-arid deserts, less than 15% humidity. Solution for urban water grids. Cheaper than traditional infrastructure where it exists. But here's why I think this matters more than the skeptics realize. Climate change is making our water future unpredictable. Rivers are drying up, aquifers are depleting, droughts are longer. We need diversity in water sources, not just desalination, not just recycling, not just conservation, all of the above, plus new technologies we haven't fully explored yet. AWG might only serve 1% of global water needs, but for that 1%, the Bedouin village with no wells, the disaster zone with destroyed infrastructure, the military unit 300 miles from supply lines, it's not supplementary its survival. Israel is betting that AWG will be part of their water security portfolio, not the main act, but a crucial backup. And in a region where water has sparked wars, having multiple sources isn't paranoia, it's survival. The atmosphere above your head right now contains trillions of liters of water. We've spent centuries building pipes to move water from rivers and oceans. Maybe, just maybe, we should also look up. Would you install an atmospheric water generator in your home if it cost $5,000 and produced 30 liters per day, enough for drinking and cooking, completely off-grid? Let me know in the comments. Until then, stay curious, stay ambitious, and remember, the future is built by people solving impossible problems. See you next time.